Welcome to our second session of the AgriLink final conference. I'm Leanne Sutherland. I was the leader of our conceptual work package, but a lot of what we're doing in this session has a really strong empirical component. So that's why we've got Livia Costa Madureira here and Christina Micheloni, and they're going to be joining me during the session to answer questions. So as we go along through the session, please do feel free to put your questions in the chat and then we'll collate them and come back to the question and answer slide. So this is actually being broadcast from Romania. I'm here at home in Scotland where the internet access is not quite as strong. So I'm going to ask Mark to go ahead and move to the next slide. So this is our overview of what we're going to cover today. We've got about 90 minutes. We're gonna start off with a bit about why is innovation important? So looking at path dependency on farms and why actually that can be a good thing in a lot of situations. We're gonna look particularly at triggers for farm decision-making. This is intended to be interactive. So we're gonna do some work on finding out what your perspective is before we dive into what AgriLink found about triggers. And then there's the question and answer session that I mentioned. And then we're going to talk about micro -ACUS. So the knowledge networks that farmers personally bring together around a particular innovation. And again, we're gonna talk about AgriLink findings, how it can be used in practice, get a perspective from an advisor. So there's a video coming there as well as question and answer. And then we'll have you out of here in 90 minutes. So I had thought about just doing an overview of our triggering change concept. And then I realized I already had. We have a number of digital stories in the AgriLink project. So they're all on our website. So please do go and have a look. And one of them is about triggering change. It's the one I put together and we're gonna watch that now. Innovation is critically important for the future of world agriculture. Feeding the world, environmental protection, and climate change will all require major changes to farming in the next decade. In the AgriLink project, we looked at how farmers innovate. Farmers are well known for being path dependent, continuing to do the same thing year after year. This could be seen as resistance to change, but it's actually a sensible approach to managing a successful farm business. Most farmers have invested a lot of money in equipment and buildings. They have land which is best suited to producing certain things, and they have farm labor with particular skills. They also get considerable prestige and self-esteem from doing their jobs well. All of this orients farmers towards continuing to produce the same commodities, usually in the same ways, although they routinely upgrade equipment and improve their production practices. That is, they make ongoing incremental changes. Farmers do make major changes to their farming businesses, but not very often. These changes are typically inspired by some kind of trigger. A trigger event is when someone enters or leaves the farm business, if it's been unprofitable for a long period of time, or a major disease outbreak. Something happens that make the farm household think, you know what, we need to do something different if this farm is going to thrive. They start actively considering options for change, and if they find a promising one or two or more, they try them out. If these are successful, maybe with or without some tweaking, it becomes part of a new farm trajectory. Different innovations tend to be inspired by different types of trigger. So for example, conversion to organic farming or direct marketing tend to be triggered by new family members coming into the business. There's a surplus of labor and the farm household looks for a way to successfully deploy it. In contrast, although adopting precision technologies like drones or using GPS map linked to farm equipment can be inspired by an enthusiastic, technically savvy young person coming into the business, they're also quite often triggered by staff and equipment dealerships or input supply companies who show farmers a map demonstrating the cost effectiveness and profitability of the new innovation. Knowing about trigger events means that we can help farmers to make major changes and work with them to help them be successful when they're responding to a trigger event. Great. So that's what my thoughts are on triggers, and we're going to get into that in more detail in a few minutes. But in the meantime, we thought we'd find out what it is you've seen. There's a lot of advisors here in the room. There's researchers as well. What do you think are the triggers 
for change in farm decision making. So if you go to menti.com, you were there in Pierre's session just half an hour ago. This is the code that you need to put in. If you go there, just type in some words relating to what you see as the triggers for change for farmers, and we'll watch the word cloud that comes up. I'm wondering if someone could put the code in the chat so that when we shift over to the actual presentation of the, uh, the word cloud, it doesn't disappear from the screen. Do you see the word cloud because I've shifted? Ah, no, sorry. There we go. Here's the word cloud. Do you see that now? Do all oh, the codes up there? Perfect. Yep. This is fun. I love word clouds. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. We've got regulation at the middle. Climate change, cost price squeeze, economics. Money, yeah. Frustration. Succession, new entrance, yep. Losing an off-farm job. Next generation, subsidies, change in the family, family changes, yep. Curiosity, that's a good one. Climate change is coming out. Very important this week with COP going on in Glasgow. I'm sure it's at the top of your news feeds as well. Fantastic. Honest pricing, interesting. This is really, really interesting. Technophilia, education, peer farmers, societal pressure, sustainability. Really great. So as you can see, there are clearly lots of triggers, lots of different things have an influence on farm decision-making. And we're gonna shift back to the presentation. I think, I suspect we could probably do this word cloud for another 15 minutes, but we're gonna shift back to the presentation just to, to talk about what we found in the AgriLink project in relation to triggers, because you might find it surprising, especially with regulation sitting right here in the middle. So in AgriLink, we looked at eight specific types of innovation. So I apologize for the size of this, um, this table, but I will take you through it in a way that I hope is accessible. So we've got our eight different types of innovation across the top, and that's across 32 case studies. So there'll be numerous case studies within each of those topics. Technical innovations, I think, was about the largest, and then something like retro innovation had smaller numbers of cases, so they weren't all evenly divided. But what you see here is an analysis of the triggers for these particular innovations. And what you see is that different triggers exist for different types of innovation. So Mark, if we could hit the button and see one come up. Um, we're, actually <laughs> we're actually missing one because there should be one that comes up for envision. That one, yes. It's the one that I was looking for. Thank you. So the most common. So as Pierre said in his presentation, this is a proposive sample. It's not a representative sample. We went looking for adopters, droppers, and non-adopters of particular innovations. But the volume of the responses that we've got means that it it's likely to reflect a lot of the trends across Europe. You just can't say that X percent of farmers across Europe have this particular trigger for this particular event. So it's indicative rather than um, predictive. But what we find is that when you ask farmers about what their triggers are, they will say that solutions for farm development, so they're actually actively looking to progress their farm, is one of the biggest triggers that they have. If we go on to the next one, Mark. 
being influenced by an advisor is important. So we've got advisors that are playing an important role. But if you look across this line, what you'll see is that actually they're pretty important for common management of natural resources, but they don't turn up at all in something like direct marketing. And we're going to get into that more in a minute, but actually different types of advisor tend to have influence on different type of innovations. If we can go to the next one. So being influenced by other actors or projects comes out as just as important as being influenced by an advisor. So these are the different things that research institutes put on, different events that are maybe put together by a group of people or the kind of projects like the European Commission projects or the um, operational groups. So there's a range of things fall in that category. The next one, Mark. This one we really wanted to highlight and it's the importance of a personal family event. And that was coming out as well in our word cloud that farm succession in particular, or somebody leaving the farm, it can often be a big trigger for change. And we think that's a particularly important one for thinking about how can we inspire major changes in farming is to work with these kind of trigger events, particularly these kind of events that can be somewhat predictable, like young people coming in, for instance, to help farms make major transitions at that point. If we go into the next one, Mark, what you'll see is that actually subsidies, very little impact, at least in the innovation areas that we looked at. So we recognize that we picked these on the basis of their contribution to sustainability, but they're not comprehensive. There are innovations that aren't covered in our table, but if you go into the next one, Mark, yeah, you'll see that complying with legislation and benefiting from subsidies, actually pretty weak in this particular study in terms of how farmers are influenced to make a change. The other ones having to do with, with looking for solutions or farm's own activity or the work of advisors, for example, or a different change in the farming family situation have a much, much bigger influence. Moving forward to the next mark. And so then just to take you through the triggering change model, again, yes, Pierre's posting in the chat, but please do feel free to ask questions as we go. I think he's maybe getting a bit anxious that we haven't had any come up so far. So I did explain this a bit in the digital story, but what we've done in AgriLink is essentially validate the triggering change model. So we simplified it a bit. We looked at the, we looked at awareness and triggers kind of at the same time, because what we discovered is when you're looking at more incremental innovations, awareness is often enough to be a trigger, just discovering that there's something new that can happen. The triggering change model was originally developed for working with major changes, so particularly convergent to organic farming, but kind of major shifts in farming trajectory where you're going in a very different direction, whereas some of the innovations that we looked at in AgroLink were actually fairly minor, you know, sheep bells, for instance, aren't going to change the trajectory and maybe simple awareness is enough to get you moving in that direction. We also looked at this active assessment process to see who was involved in the active assessment of a farm business and the, um, the innovation going forward. And then we looked at implementation and consolidation as one thing, because what we found was that farmers don't actually differentiate. Although it makes sense to us as academics to think about first starting to implement versus actually then embedding it in the farm business, farmers couldn't distinguish between different advisors at that stage. Oh, sorry, and I'm wrapping on in Canadian English. <laughs> sorry, Annalise. So what I was saying then is that we simplified the model into three. So we looked at awareness and triggers as one. We looked at active assessment as the second stage. And then we looked at consolidation and implementation as a third stage. And those are the three things that we looked at. In this process, we learned a lot about co-innovation. So the triggering change model was developed in 2012. And that was when it was published. And there's been a lot happened in the nearly decades since then, particularly around how farmers co-innovate and learn. So we included more about co-innovation in the model and our revision to draw attention to the fact that actually there's a lot of movement at the bottom part of this model. So farmers can go from awareness to active assessment to implementation and keep changing on an ongoing basis, particularly when the, in the innovations are incremental or easily changed. So if we shift on to the next one, Mark, we've got a farmer who's gonna talk about his triggering change process. In this short video, I would like to share my insights on the role of advisory services in farmers' decision-making on the uptake and on the consolidation of a direct marketing innovation that exists in Northeast Italy. And that was one of the case studies included in AgriLink's work package two. The innovation is called Godo and is essentially a collective social direct marketing structure that connects local organic producers with local consumers. 
There are over 40 farms to take part in this innovative structure and more keep joining. But what is that triggered and keeps triggering farmers to consider adopting this innovation? Well, there are of course multiple different reasons, but they tend to fall within two main areas. On one side, there are commercial reasons, for example, farmers needing to increase sales and reach a wider customer base. And on the other, there are uh, social reasons, for example, having positive impact on the local community. All farms involved are certified organic. We know that organic farmers tend to be more sensitive and show more interest on certain topics compared to conventional farmers and tend to be more active in building on their knowledge and their skills, as well as be more prone to create connection and network with other farmers. This is definitely the case of the farmers that take part in this specific innovation. This context allows the creation of a very strong and positive connection between farmers and advisors. But who is giving advice and support to these farmers? Well, throughout all stages of the innovation cycle, the most important and active advice and support providers are members of the association that runs this innovative system. Advice on how to run the administrative and the logistical aspects are given by the people who run the innovation on accounts for the association, while all the aspects concerning technical advice are given by the agronomist of the association. It is very interesting to point out the role the pioneer farmers have in this community as well. They in fact have an active role in supporting new farms in the process of adopting the innovation, as well as working alongside them in the later stages of implementation and assessment. This strong relationship that has been created between new farmers, pioneer farmers and advisors, which is characterized by mutual respect and open communication, is what seems to allow the innovation to thrive. Farmers are usually satisfied with the type of advice given to them, but also they um, point out some aspects that could be improved and that are currently seen as a limit to the development of the system. The inclusion within the advisory network of a professional that is competent in communication and marketing, but also knowledgeable about organic agriculture and local markets is one of these aspects. I think this experience shows how building trust, building relationships and building communities are all key factors for good flow of knowledge and innovation between advisors and farmers. Also, it shows how there is need for implementation of multidisciplinary advisory teams. Great. Thanks, Mark. So we're into our question and answer session now. So I'm going to hand over to Pierre, who's moderating that. It's been good to see some questions coming up in the chat. Feel free to, to add some more. I'm also going to ask Olivia and Christina if they can turn their cameras on so that we can see them as well. They're the experts on our, this is mostly work package two research, and they are definitely the experts on it. Uh, so can you hear me? Mm -hmm. So uh, let's start with the first question. So thanks, thanks for, to all of you. Um, maybe I will first give the floor to, uh, to Paul Daniels, if Paul is with us. Uh, raise a question uh, that was also a point raised by Tom Kelly, uh, which was about uh, long-term versus short-term and how uh, you know, decision-making we uh, model. How would you, uh, so maybe, uh, Paul, if you can phrase your points. Uh, yes, I made the remark that um, in um, advisory, one should um, uphold a kind of systemic um, innovation view. Uh, what we have had until now is above all uh, focus on um, production yields, short time uh, short term uh, values like uh, getting as much as possible to the market for a uh, cheap price often a cheap price is demanded that is uh, surely the, uh, the experience here in the Netherlands uh, but it's about sustainability and also healthy food for consumers and consumers need to understand that they have to value this it doesn't come for free, especially not when it has to be sustainable, innovative, and uh, climate change proof. Uh, so it's 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 more than only the advisor that has to advise on a certain method or innovation to improve the production, but it's the whole system that makes or breaks the whole system. So long-term views. 
including all participants, inclusive, inclusive uh, industries, uh, food producing uh, uh, companies, multinationals, but above all, the consumer which is pretty complicated. Thank you, Paul. Uh, maybe uh, I will ask uh, Tom to also comment. You have a, maybe kind of similar, Tom Kelly, you have a similar on long-term, short-term. Uh, maybe you can elaborate as well. Yeah, I just crossed my mind that uh, the day-to-day uh, the -day decisions uh, advisors send out a lot of information to farmers uh, and respond to a lot of queries, which are based on very much kind of what I would call management decisions of farmers and supporting or affirming the farmer's own opinion maybe in relation to, to decisions. So the degree to which this, uh, these triggers are maybe quite different if you look at uh, a short-term decision-making in some individual context, I, I would imagine, maybe I'm wrong, but that's just my question. Yeah, uh, yeah I think you're probably right. Sorry, Pierre. No, no, I was just giving you of you, Christina, and you get the floor for answering, so please, please go. So the triggering change model was originally developed for major changes, so transformative changes in farming trajectory. So modifying it for, I think what you're talking about, which is more incremental shifts and the kinds of decisions that farmers make, but it's still very much about taking on new technology. So I think what you're talking about is more kind of day-to-day -day kind of decision-making, is that right? Tom? Yes, it's a, yes, it's a big part of, of uh, advisory work is supporting uh, issues and day-to-day -day problems that are, uh, farmers see in the field or see with uh, various animals and, uh, you know, are, we are not in the same uh, category as veterinary surgeons just delivering uh, the cure. We are oftentimes trying to saw, see the problem as well. And for that reason, uh, I think we have a, an enormous credibility with farmers in terms of if you build a relationship based on small uh, incremental uh, advice, which helps and supports the decisions uh, of the farmer then or the farm family then that leads to bigger things and this is maybe something that I, I was just querying whether that framework of looking at triggers is is would be quite diff would be different or look different if you if you had said you know the the, the um, a set a different question in terms of the type of decision that the farmer had to make. Well, I think you've got a good point that there are a lot of incremental decisions that go on on an ongoing basis, but certainly what we were, I think the risk with a lot of incremental decision making is that it is part of path dependency. And like I say, I mean, path dependency makes good sense for a lot of farm businesses in what they're doing because they have their sunk costs, they have their skill set, they have their advisors that they already work with, that'll keep them going in the same trajectory. But if we want farmers to actually change and do something different, then that's where I think the concept of triggers can be quite powerful. I mean, I'm sure for incremental innovation, farmers have a reason for contacting you. There's, a, you know, there's been something that's triggered them to go, you know what, I need some extra advice on this because they don't necessarily call you every day of the week. So in that sense, I think a trigger is valid, but I think it's particularly powerful when we're looking at these larger, more transformative changes on farms. If I may add on, on that also, several of the cases we, we dealt with in work package two were not new or just recent changes, were changes that took place in the last seven, eight, 10 years. So we also had groups with different, different level of maturity, let's say. So where innovation was started to be implemented seven years ago, eight years ago, and we could somehow have a summary of the process all over those years. Also because several of the part partners were already in contact with the, with the groups uh, assessing and implementing the, the change. So somehow several of the were packaged to cases were long-term changes that we made a movie on, not only a picture. I don't know if it was clear, the, the image. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. Just maybe to move on, uh, there was uh, another question by uh, Pascal Bergeret, which was about the individual versus collective dimension of uh, trigger. So, um, Pascal, maybe if you can elaborate a bit on your question, please. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, yes, it seems to me that the, the model you are, uh, you are uh, presenting uh, relates to uh, individual innovation, how the specific farmers, uh, a specific farmer influenced by his environment, the advisors, the peers, and all those, uh, uh, feels the need to innovate in his own farm, eh? and it's the, the trigger. But there are also innovations that result from a collective project. Uh, for instance, uh, you can have a situation where a, a set of farmers have to protect a specific water source that is, uh, uh, that is used for, for drinking water or whatever. And then they have to innovate collectively or each uh, part of, of the group, if, if every group member has to, to provide some innovation is in his own farm, but the, 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 the collective image has to be coherent. Same uh, if we think about uh, watersheds, for instance, or how collectively to manage uh, a landscape uh, with farming practices, things like that. I was wondering whether this kind of trigger or this kind of situation was included in, in, uh, in your model and in, in the cases you have, uh, you have followed. Oh, for sure. I mean, one of our kind of clusters of cases had to do with collective action on, the, on behalf of farmers. And I'm actually going to be talking about that in relation to microacus next, but I wondered if Christina or Olivia wanted to comment specifically on the collective action ones and if triggers were any different. I can comment, Olivia, if you want to comment, I'm glad, but just briefly, well, the, the collective um, direct marketing you heard about in the movie was a collective action and it cannot exist, exist or it cannot function if it is not a collective. And also the, we had some cases, one in Italy, one in uh, Scotland, and now I go by heart, but probably Livia can, can give you more figures about that also, uh, about uh, landscape or collective action towards environmental protection to, to some of, of the elements of, of environment. Would, could it be water or landscape or, or, or whatever? In, in the case in Italy, it was about landscape, for example. And there as well, it was not the matter of one farmer decided to do something because it would not uh, reach the goal, but it was a matter of group of farmers going together towards a change. Otherwise, uh, was not uh, really delivering the, the result. Okay, um, maybe next question. Uh, there is a challenging one by Andrea Kirim. Hi, Andrea about the added value of the micro concept compared to a former way of analyzing adoption by farmers. So maybe Andrea, you may raise your point and then we, we try to, uh, to answer to your challenging questions, so please. Andrea? Yes, hello. Hi, um, <laughs> yeah, thank you for uh, giving me opportunity. Um, it's really, more about my question is really about um, why you use this idea of the acres at the micro level, as I understand it from your presentation here. So it is it is not challenging the the, the way how you go for the innovation process, but rather why this terminology of micro acres seems appropriate to you. Because I think so far in the literature and foremost also in the policies now, we use the ACUS concept to address sectoral, regional, and even national level um, knowledge systems and innovation processes and so on. And now you use it on, to my understanding, on a local level, which, yeah, somehow it, it led me to that question, what would be the advantage to, to have this now at this level? Because I see certain risks to, to get the ACUS um, concept, which is now so relevant for practice and for policymakers, for decision makers, um, rather twisted or 
how in my English, but but yeah, somehow that it blurs rather with this, and then it gets more concrete. That's my question. Thank you. Well, I think that's actually quite a good segue into the next section of the presentation because it is actually all about microacus. So what I'm going to suggest is that I talk a bit more about microacus and why we think we found it useful. So I'll kind of answer your question as part of the next presentation, and then we can maybe come back to it in the question and answer after that section. Does that sound all right? And I, I will have some element of answers as well. Uh, I hope to this question. As the next one, I would go <laughs> to uh, to uh, maybe uh, Andrew uh, raise a question about um, uh, the role of peers and, and family in uh, in microacus. I guess you have a point on this and, uh, that you were surprised by some of the results. So Andrew, maybe uh, you can elaborate on this or on other point that you had in mind. No, no, I don't. I don't think so. I was just contributing to uh, other people's um, um, input into the chat rather than having a, a point of my own. I think. Okay, then I will. Uh, uh, I will then hand the floor to uh, Susan von Minchhausen. You had uh, you had a comment on the on the triggering change model, and uh, you wanted to have some specification, maybe that. Uh, about the, the different phases compared to your experience, or maybe you could raise your point. Uh, different phases? Yeah, you have a, a comment, I'm sorry, but we have maybe, so it's, it's a bit up now. It was, um, so it was about, uh, what about kitchen discussion and planning and how does it fit? Oh, uh, yeah, 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 it, yeah sorry. Question, so it was, Maybe 10 minutes ago. Exactly. So it related directly to your chart that you were showing, Lien. Um, and I thought there was a jump between phase three and four because three was the assessment. Mm -hmm. So if somebody thinks, oh, okay, my situation is not the best. I need to change something. I have every day a problem with something. And then the next was implementation. So implementation is, I have the solution at hand and I implement it. So I have bought a, a new thing. I have learned something, how I can change whatever. And then I was thinking, oh, there is so much happening between uh, assessment. So I understand there is a problem I need to change and implementing something new. And that's why I was wondering how exact, exactly you were addressing everything that is happening in between, including looking for advice and the different types of advice. Well, I think, I think what's happened is I maybe didn't explain the trigger concept very well. So I think what you're talking about is assessment and this kind of realization that I need, I need to change something is actually in the model, that's the triggering process. So the trigger isn't necessarily a single event. It can be a series of events. So I'm, I'm losing money over time, for instance, on the farm, or I can see a successor coming into the business, or there's kind of, there's a disease outbreak happening. It's not in the trigger term is perhaps a bit misleading because it actually refers to that process that you've just talked about where the farmer comes to a realization or the farm household comes to a realization that wait a minute this isn't working something needs to happen and then what happens in the access assessment phase is that's when they start looking for options so they start thinking what can I do to address this problem what can I do to help I've got extra labor coming in what do I do with that or I've got less labor or I've got less money and that's the assessment phase. And that's where you see them sitting around the table as a farm household talking about, you know, what are we going to do? What's the best option given the resources we have? And it's not until they identify a viable solution that they then head into implementation. So yeah, Libby just put up in the chat is that awareness. So they may be becoming aware. So farmers become aware of innovations all the time. You know, they go to events, they read the farming press, that kind of thing. But a trigger is something that makes you think, you know what, I need to act on this awareness and, and see what else is out there. So I think that's where those processes happen. And some of the more detailed work that we've done, we've looked at the change from scientific knowledge to tacit knowledge. So going from this kind of almost scientific assessment or what are the options through to a more kind of experiential, let's try this out and see what works. In the model as well, it's entirely possible that they don't find a solution. 
And that's when you see farms exiting the business, for instance. So they leave the agricultural sector because they see that they're just going to continue hemorrhaging money until the farm is gone, or they head into retirement or they do something else. So it's not a guarantee that they're going to be successful with the trigger cycle. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah. So far. Thanks. Um, then I may give the floor to, um, to uh, Sylvain Sturel, um, who raised one question about uh, uh, that maybe relates to the word cloud that we, uh, in our trigger, we did we find literal for regulation apparently in what you uh, presented, which contrasts to Sylvain's experience. So Sylvain Sturel, could you please uh, bring your question? Because I think there were other questions related to yours and uh, kind of debate that started on the chat. So. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pierre. Uh, yes, um, uh, I just uh, uh, pointed out that uh, um, in, in some cases, I, I think that uh, the role of subsidies can be very important. Um, uh, for example, uh, in, um, in the Common Agricultural Policy, there, um, there are subsidies for farm moder modernization. And uh, at, at least in France, I, I know that uh, there are really thousands of uh, farms who have um, uh, improved uh, their livestock buildings uh, thanks to these uh, subsidies. Uh, and uh, there, there, there have been major, ma major changes on livestock farms in France uh, thanks to these subsidies. So, um, yes, I, I think uh, at least uh, in some cases, uh, it can play an important role. And I also gave another example. I don't think it is uh, within the cap. I, I should uh, check that. Uh, but there are also subsidies uh, to um, encourage uh, the development of uh, photovoltaic uh, energy. And uh, uh, thanks to these subsidies, uh, a lot of farmers have installed uh, uh, solar panels on their barns and, uh, and other farm buildings. Uh, so, yes. Uh, I, Yes, uh, so that, that, that's why I was a bit surprised by the general table that was uh, showed um, uh, a few minutes ago. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's fair enough. I think it is probably a factor of the types of innovations that we looked at, that we didn't happen to look at any innovations that had a direct subsidy behind them, pushing them forward. So if we had looked at photovoltaics, it probably would have come out quite differently. But I think there is kind of a general point that just general access to farm subsidies and having money available through the single farm payment doesn't necessarily lead to innovation. But yeah, where there are specific, I mean, certainly it happened here in Scotland when there were subsidies a few years ago to put up new farm sheds. Loads of farmers put up new farm sheds. I would say that's definitely a trigger because farmers are on the lookout for that kind of thing. Any, any other comments, Olivia? You wanted to uh... maybe, maybe I can add that <clears throat> the, the existence of uh, policy incentives has been considered as a trigger, and uh, is actually a trigger in some cases. Yes, for instance, in the biological pest control or well, soil improvement crop soil improvement. Cropping, it depends on, on the innovations, but in some cases, the, the, the policies, namely agro-environmental policies, have actually worked as a trigger for innovation. For instance, for, uh, even for technolo technological innovation, for uh, when there are, um, for instance, agro-environmental measures incentivizing eco-efficiency, so yes. The answer, my answer would be yes, the, the, the policies could be uh, and are in fact a trigger for some types of innovations in some, some contests. Um, I think we will have to, uh, to close this first one of Q&A. I think we are uh, on a good timing for the moment, so we can uh, we can continue and we will have a second round uh, of discussion on the micro equis where we will, uh, we won't forget Andrea's question because it's an important one. Uh, so let's, uh, let's continue uh, uh, the flow uh, of presentation and then we will have a second uh, one. So thanks for your contribution and please continue for the next one. Right, so that's our, our PowerPoint back up on the screen. And we're heading to, into microwave.
Okay, so the second half essentially of the session is very much about microacus. And so as Andrea mentioned, I mean, there's a there's an open question of, is this the right term for what we're describing? But I think what we're going to demonstrate is that it's actually a really useful approach, certainly. What we were aiming for with the microacus concept was to find out from whom farmers are seeking advice. So we wanted to get beyond the idea that the usual suspects are necessarily the source of advice. We wanted to just go straight to farmers because there are, we knew for sure that there are a lot of new actors in the agricultural sector who are offering advice, whether that's advice because they're input suppliers or they're friends of the family or maybe they're bookkeepers or in the financial sector. So we wanted to narrow in on what are the sources of advice that farmers actually draw on to deal with a particular innovation. So we're looking for the knowledge system that farmers personally assemble, including the range of individuals and organizations from whom farmers seek services and exchange knowledges, as well as the processes involved and how they translate this into innovative activities or not. So we'll go to the next slide. And so what we did essentially was ask all 1,000 of the farmers that we interviewed what their sources of advice were for at three stages in the model. So the awareness kind of triggering stage because there was a lot of overlap there, then what their sources of advice were at the assessment stage, and then what they were at the implementation consolidation phase. So those three levels. And what we found out was that microacus, so the number of people that they talked to at each of those stages, was surprisingly small. So we hear about the plurality of advice and the wide range of different sources of advice that are available across Europe, and that certainly came out in the analysis. But in terms of who farmers actually talk to for advice, typically it was two or three sources at most. And then, and that was typically at the awareness stage. And then when you get past the trigger awareness stage and into the assessment and the implementation phases, they got smaller still. So if we go on to, if you click the button again, Mark, we'll get this table. And I recognize the table has got a lot of data in it, but it shows you some interesting things. So we've got adopter, non-adopter and dropper across the top. So you can see that in the survey as a whole, so this is for the collective action. So the um, communal management of agro-environmental things in particular. So this was a subset of our data. So that's why we've got sort of 100 and 20 or so respondents on this particular topic, and most of them are adopters because those are the easiest to find. But if you click again, Mark, you'll see an arrow come up. And what this table shows pretty clearly is that when you're looking at the number of people that different types of farmers, so adopters, non-adopters, and droppers interact with, you'll see that there, the adopters have a lot more than the non-adopters and the droppers. They have a lot better access or they're a lot more able to access advice. But even so, if you look at the number of actors they interact with, which is the, the line on the left, like the vertical line on the left, you'll see that the vast majority in this particular case had one. <laughs> so 74 of our adopters at awareness stage had one source of advice. Less than a quarter of them had more than that. Then as you carry on through the cycle, what you see is that in assessment phase, that number drops. So you get 26 farmers with actually no support at assessment stage, and that goes up to 29 at implementation. So there's some interesting things going on here with the amount of support that's available to farmers or that they choose to draw on at different stages of the cycle. When you look at non-adopters, for instance, you see that a lot of them they did have some awareness, clearly, because they had somebody that was giving them advice, but actually then very little help with the assessment or anyone to give them information on how this might actually work in terms of their own business. Then when you look at droppers, and I recognize that this is a very small number for this topic, but it's consistent with the larger kind of characteristics that droppers often may actually have a larger microacres. They may have more information at awareness stage, but again, it's the assessment and implementation phases where they may have very little help at all. So if we go on to the next one, Mark. <laughs> so we just skimmed through, I did have circles around all of those, but we'll carry on to the next one. So this is what it looks like in terms of microacus. So the previous table was just showing us the number of people that they were interacting with. This particular graph shows us who those people were. So it's on the same topic, collective management of natural resources, and it's just at the awareness stage. So this would get smaller 
as we carry on through the other stages, but we thought one of these graphs was probably enough for you right now. And what it shows is that public advisory services are particularly important here. Sorry, I'm just checking to see. I got a, a note up saying that my internet connection was unstable. So I was just checking to see if you guys could still hear me. So the public advisory services are quite important. Farmers themselves, so peer farmers are particularly important, but more so for non-adopters. So what we're seeing here is that your public advisory services are being really helpful for people that adopt, but non-adopters appear to be struggling to access them. So they're going to private advisory services or they're going to other farmers for information. And then the droppers, there's very few of them in the middle. Again, they're primarily reliant on other farmers. For whatever reason, they're not accessing the public advisory services. As we go on to the next slide, these are examples of different kinds of innovations. So we've got direct marketing here on the left. And what you see in that one is that NGOs and peer farmers are particularly important for adopters, but it's a very different shape to what's happening for technological innovations, where the private sector, so that's where we're seeing input suppliers, for instance, research and development, and in some cases from business organizations are having a big, big impact on the awareness of these particular innovations. So this is where we think Microwakis is really helpful is because it tells you more than the kind of national level perspective on who's available providing advice, it actually helps us narrow in on who are farmers actually getting advice for from on particular topics. On to the next one, Mark. I wanted to focus in for a few minutes on the microacus of droppers. So this is a particular innovation of the AgriLink project. As you can imagine, it's a bit difficult to try and locate people who have started into an innovation and then decided, I'm not gonna carry on with it. But we did have about a hundred of these in the overall data set, which is a good number to learn some things about what is it that happened that they started implementing the innovation and then changed their minds. And so what we discovered using this microacus concept is that the microacus of droppers and non-adopters is smaller than that of adopters. So that's what you saw in the initial graph, the table, sorry, at the beginning. They had access to fewer sources of advice. And from this, we have identified three types of droppers. So we've got ones that abandoned the innovation due to advisory gaps. So we did quite a number of qualitative interviews as well as our standard interviews for the surveys. And what we discovered is that it was, they really felt the lack of advice and they were less willing to reintroduce the innovation again in the near future. So a lot of droppers actually said, you know what, we just think it's too soon for us. We are gonna try it at some point down the road, but the ones that didn't have much access to advice were more likely to give up on it altogether. We also found that there's a cohort of droppers who are quite interested in innovation. So the, the typical picture of a dropper is that this is somebody who's really just not that well connected. And that does happen. So that's the first type. But the second type are farmers that actually were really motivated, but it just wasn't going to work for their farm. And quite often, these are smaller and medium-sized farms, so particularly with technological innovations, but also with some of the others, that they just haven't got the resources to make this particular innovation work at this particular point in time. And then we've got well-informed farmers. So this was an interesting cohort where they actually had a much larger microacus than the people who adopted. So these are farmers who had actively explored this innovation and tried it out, but still decided actually, you know what, the best informed decision is not to do it. So we also wanted to point out that this is where microacus of individual farmers is quite helpful because their microacus may look very, very different to what's normal or what the pattern is for the other farmers in their geographic region that are considering that innovation. On to the next one. So we're gonna look again briefly here at microacus by different type of innovation. So when you're looking at technological innovation, so we saw a graph on that earlier. So this is high reliance on linked advice. So that's what I was saying about these are where your input suppliers are providing a lot. The problem with input suppliers beyond the fact that they're not you know, independent is that they don't typically, they're not typically oriented towards supplying advice later on. So once you've bought their product, they're quite happy to get you to install it, for instance, if it's a milking robot in the first couple of days, but then you're pretty much on your own. 
So they don't have that kind of follow-up because their business model is all about selling. We do want to make clear that actually in the, for technological innovation, input suppliers can be really, really important. And that's because the innovations are changing so rapidly. It's pretty much impossible for a publicly funded or a traditional advisor service to keep up with the new innovations. They actually are more important for later adopters. So once the technology is better established and you've got a, a clear market for it and a clear kind of body of knowledge that they can invest in, that's when your publicly funded advisory services are a lot more helpful. This is interesting finding too, that droppers have smaller microwaves than non-adopters. That's what I was saying earlier, that sometimes non-adopters have actively sussed out the situation and gone, you know what, this is not for me. Whereas some of the, the ones who have gone into it have maybe not looked clearly enough at it before they got involved. Now, biological pest control, similarly, there's a reliance on input suppliers. So who's selling the technologies are giving that kind of advice. But interestingly, your non-adopters are relying primarily on other farmers. So they're not trusting the input suppliers or the other for sources of information that are there. They're talking to other farmers about the, what their experience is, and they're saying no. And so this is an example of where the microwake is, is actually larger for droppers and non-adopters for, than for the ones that just charged ahead and tried it out. On to the next one. So for a further example, so process innovation, so that's something to do with, you know, soil improvements, for instance, so the process and way that you do things on the farm. And so for droppers, it was because there were unexpected outcomes or it was just too complicated. It was much more complicated that they, than it seemed at the initial pitch for this, and they decided not to go ahead. But we wanted to point out, though, that for most innovations, droppers are postponing rather than rejecting the innovation altogether. They go, you know what, this isn't right for me right now. Maybe when the technology improves, maybe when the information is better, that's when we'll get involved in this down the road. The exception to this are market innovation. So particularly direct marketing, this seems to be something that farmers will try once. And if it doesn't work, then that's it. <laughs> They're not going to try it again. They express no intention of trying it again in future. So if that's an innovation that we want, if we want more direct marketing, short food supply chains, some of these things that can be really good for sustainability, it's important that they have a lot of support off the start. And this was clearly an area that came out in the countries that we looked at, that the public advisory services just weren't equipped to help support this kind of innovation because they had a lot more to do with marketing than it did to do with production. On to the next one. So just to sum up this, I'm going to come up back to this again with policy recommendations, but I can see questions are coming up to the in the chat, so we'll go through those soon. We think that there's a lot of potential in microacus to make it a really practical, useful tool for understanding what's going on at farm level. I agree, Andrea, that maybe the term microacus isn't the right one. It is the one that we came up with. So we've stuck with it through the project because it was in our original proposal. But we see a lot of potential for looking at these different stages in the cycle and thinking about how can we really work with them. So maybe there are some stages of the cycles, like triggers, for instance, where we can actively work with triggers. And that's about who to target. So I've put in the bottom there about successors and farms in transition. So if we can identify farms that have been triggered. So there's been a major disease outbreak. There's, um, there's been a successor come into the business and you can often tell that by the age of the farmer or the kind of help that they're looking for. There's been a downturn in commodity markets for a particular commodity. These are farms that are primed to make a big change. And so if we can provide targeted support at that stage, then that can be really powerful, we think, for incentivizing major transitions. It's also pretty clear from our analysis that there needs to be more support at the assessment and implementation stages. And the European Commission is already moving in this direction. This is the whole idea of interactive innovation and enabling these kinds of collaborative things to go forward. So we think there needs to be more, more of this made available. And that may be a very strong area for the publicly funded advisory services, the FAS, to get involved with. We think it's important to work differently with adopters, droppers and non-adopters, and potentially focusing particularly on people who are at risk of dropping, maybe because their farm sizes are smaller or because they don't have the resources. Sorry, Suzanne, I get excited and I'm rabbiting on again. <laughs> so I will, I will slow down. So yeah, we think there are opportunities here to work differently with adopters, droppers and non-adopters, and to think of them in more positive terms. 
So what our analysis has shown is that actually, although you might have what Rogers would term laggards or people who are adopting later, there are often quite good reasons, including lack of support and lack of advice for not proceeding with innovations. And I think now we're going to shift to the next slide, which is somebody speaking in slower English about their experience with triggering change. Hello, my name is Luca Delisanti. I am part of a team of viticulture consultants uh, of my company Perle Uve. We are based in Friuli Venezia Giulia in Italy and we help farmers and wineries in improving quality, healthiness and productivity of their vineyards uh, across Italy and Europe. So there, no, there is no simple answer on how to support innovation in agriculture. As in many other fields, change is subject to changing people's minds and this can be achieved in a variety of ways and for different goals. Some people are mainly interested in the economical aspects because they want to improve their revenue. Others want to reduce their ecological footprint. Uh, others are driven by just pure passion for grape quality, for example, for minimal inputs or even just because they love um, trying out new technology and uh, its application. Moreover, each person is responsive to different types of stimuli. For example, some farmers are triggered simply by being presented with a new idea through discussion, and they will adopt new solutions even by taking our word or just by being presented with scientific evidence. Others can be convinced only by seeing innovation in practice. So they can be convinced exclusively by uh, seeing the outcomes of these new practices. Uh, this hands-on approach is actually very common amongst uh, winemakers who have an active role in day-to-day -day operations in the vineyard. This means that some winemakers are more likely to be early adopters of innovative practices than others. Early adopters are mostly those who are open to change uh, are also prepared to take slightly higher entrepreneurial risks uh, to reach their goals faster. Often, often we find that these people uh, are the most successful in managing their vineyards in the long term, uh, but are also the best in managing their company overall. Formamentis of each person is probably the most important factor in supporting innovation, however we have little control over it. However, as a consulting company, we take an active role in overcoming distrust about new technology. So today I want to share two examples on, um, uh, on how we achieved this. Um, this year we helped to implement two, two, two new tools. One is a new generation of soil tiller and the other is um, soil microbiome analysis. So for the soil tiller, we organized several demo days in different Italian regions with farmers where the new tiller would truly really benefit them in reaching their goals. We bridge the distance between manufacturer, customer and the science behind it, showing the real effects in a real life scenario. Moreover, we also explain the relevance of its use based on scientific evidence gathered through academic literature. This is information that would otherwise be unavailable or difficult to interpret for the general public. Then we introduced on the Italian market a new type of microbiome analysis uh, of the soil which explores nutritional and pathological characteristics of the soil from a new point of view. Uh, reports generates, generated by this um, analysis are truly insightful but often require substantial background knowledge for a good understanding. Therefore, we offer our customers a tailored discussion in which we use data of the report to address specific issues in the vineyard and offer practical solutions to implement it in everyday, in their everyday work. Summarizing, as a consulting company, we promote innovation in agriculture by giving insightful and objective information to our customers uh, with hands-on demos and concise explanations on how new tools will help them in achieving specific results. Great, so that is us into our second question and answer session. So if we can get Livia and Christina back up and Pierre commenting on some of the 
the things that have come up in the chat. We've put in a couple of questions for you. So we're really curious for, we'd like this to be a discussion really that we're curious to see if you can see potential uses for these concepts, microacus and triggering change and how this resonates with your, your practical experience. Oh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Uh, so uh, we'll start again this second uh, Q&A session. Uh, we are a bit ahead of time, which is un unexpected. So, but we uh, then we have plenty of time for this uh, second round before we conclude. We can take uh, twenty minutes to have a to have a discussion with you. Uh, maybe I will. Uh, just take the floor for two minutes to start answering to uh, Andrea and then maybe having Andrea to, to comment back on that because I think it was a, a very relevant question about uh, why uh, coming with a new concept uh, uh, with AKIS. Um, I start to answer in the, in the chat. Um, there are two different perspectives. The first one is academic. It's uh, how to, to have a concept to understand changes in uh, in in the dynamic of of, of Aegis. and going back to the to the to the people that came with this concept, they are clearly a great insider to understand changing in Aegis, You have to zoom in at different scales and not only rely on description of national or global scale. So our first point is to have micro as a methodological tool to understand change in Aegis. And our point of view is that by having this bottom-up perspective, you can understand transformation of APIs that you won't uh, understand if you only study APIs at the national level. And I think there have been different work on the sub APIs, micro APIs, and this kind of story that try to disentangle APIs at this sub level. So it's it's quite complementary with other study and and by showing some differences between micro APIs. And global aid, it's, it's also very important for policy making because it could indicate in form of uh, discrepancy of risk if you have policies that focus only on user suspects. And in micro aid, we may highlight some other actors uh, and gaps that may be also useful to consider in, uh, in policy or in advisory practices. So um, we find it a quite complementary uh, concept to, to understand the global dynamic of, uh, of AGIS. Um, then there is, uh, so I don't know whether you want to, to come back on your question, Andrea, would be happy, and otherwise we, uh, um, we move on to the next, uh, to the, to the next question, so. Um, yeah, I, I, I would just like to briefly react. First of all, I would really like to uh, emphasize that I find the results that you presented on the cases really very interesting and very relevant for the research on advisory services and on advisory systems. So I refer to this trigger overview. I refer to this actor constellations that you highlight in the second part and also the differentiation between droppers and non-adopters and people who actively decide not to adopt and so on. I think that's really very helpful in terms of uh, differentiating our understanding of innovation processes. And I have to admit that with regard to this aspect of micro acres, just as, as an additional uh, yeah, terminology, you did not yet convince me I think we have for this micro level, the term of a network that helps us to understand the actor constellation in, in a sociological perspective. Sometimes also this innovation system concept is even translated with the network concept um, when people look at the, at the micro at the local level. And I fear, and, and, and as this system concept is so vague, I'm, I would be rather, careful with just because now in the policies in the politics this ACUS concept gets so widely spread so I think I wonder whether it's really helpful for the in particular the practical use but I will stop with this not to to spoil too much I um yeah, I want again congratulate to all the findings that you have in particular on the innovation process that, that, that was an important and relevant point that we take into consideration. 
still think that we add to the understanding of AQs, but you may write with a, we'll, uh, we'll take this in consideration in our policy recommendation, I guess, your point. So thank you, uh, Lian. I don't know if someone else wants to elaborate on this, so should we move on to next uh, questions? Yeah, I'm happy to comment on that a bit. I mean, I think, Andrea, you're quite right that there are concepts for local level looking at networks and systems and, and that kind of thing. And we haven't got into it much in the presentation because we were just giving you some highlights, but we're working with assemblage theory, for instance, to think about. I think we need to be careful in how we think about some of the constellations and one of the values of looking specifically at farmers and maybe microwakers is more of a method than a concept might be a, a better way to think of it. So a, a method for identifying who all is involved. But I think the problem that we particularly see with ACUS is it's being used at kind of national and European level is that it, there's this kind of an assumption that everyone in the ACUS is oriented towards providing advice to farmers. And that's just really not the case, you know, that there's a lot of organizations out there providing advice that just, they don't consider themselves to be advisors, but that's who farmers go to. So that's where we were really thinking the power of the concept is, is identifying some of these unusual suspects or these sources of advice that just don't appear in the nice, I mean, we have these great diagrams from ProEcus, for instance, that have been hugely powerful, I think at European level in demonstrating the different kind of array of actors, but they can also then, implicitly exclude the actors that don't appear in those diagrams. Do you know what I mean? So that's where I think microwakers can be particularly helpful as, as a method that you can use at local level. My concern with the term like network is it suggests that there is an existing network, that there is an existing kind of set of interactions. And I suppose to a degree that's true, but I think what we're finding is that farmers can be quite atomized. They actually can pull on different things at different times and make ties that were passive quite active for a short period of time and then disappear again. So I think the word network also can be misleading because it suggests that there's some durable ties that are there that exist long term, that everyone's just, it's just about integrating a farmer into a network of information and then they'll have access. And maybe that's a, a semantic thing, but we really appreciate the criticism and the critical feedback on it because we need that. If it's going to be useful, then yeah, we really need people to come push back and say, well, what about this? Yes. So thanks for the critical comment. That's what we expect also. Not the, uh, <laughs> we, not, we not it just a congratulation. So critical thinking is always appreciated. Um, so, and, and right first with what Liam said, we should put an emphasis that it's first of all a, a methodological uh, entry rather than a, a new concept for APIs. Um, I will drop to a uh, Michel Kugler question then, which is quite interesting and related to this methodology, whether a micro ACIS or local ACIS will be the same. I would say no, personally, that uh, our personal uh, network uh, are not always uh, local and that we see some farmers using some uh, resources much more way. But maybe uh, Christina or Livia, you have a, a comment on this, whether micro ACIS are local or not, or, or, Li or Lian. Of the um, maybe I can come back to the, the former question because, um, well, in the presentation, probably uh, we conveyed the idea that the micro is, is just a network of actors that are influencing or supporting the farmers. But it's more than that, and we collect much more information, not only about the dynamic, the network, but also about uh, the way the, these interactions take place and the role of the knowledge and innovation infrastructure interact with these networks. So it's much more than simple social networks. Of course, we thought it also as social networks, but this far is more than that. And I think that is probably more clear if you read the synthesis report of the working package too that is available in the web uh, site free link yeah and if i can uh, say something about local and uh, and uh, and micro uh, that they are different it, it change of course uh, some, sometimes they overlap partially overlap but it's much more than local and many farmers show they have links, especially through digital tools, through internet, through LinkedIn or, or other tools, 
with somebody else who is who is not in the same place, can be even far away. But what <laughs> is um, is important is that they share some ideas. They have trust, so there is a, a relationship based on trust and uh, and somehow the will to to exchange. So it's not local at all. At least half of it is not local, but it has more to do with the the sharing of the same interest. Is it fair to say that particularly for pioneering farmers? The now it's not local because they have there's yeah. no local knowledge, so they have to go much yeah. further afield. Yeah, exactly, and they have to look wherever it is for for somebody who is uh, as in mind something similar to what they want to do, and then that that's the best uh, way they they can develop their own way of implementing it. So especially for the front runners, and we saw especially for organic, for especially for innovations also linked to um, collective uh, co collective uh, actions or, or also for environmental improvement. They are looking for somebody who did it. That's it, wherever he or she is. Um, Santana will switch to another category of question. Uh, we answer, I guess your presentation on drop has raised attention and we have two uh, questions related to this. One was from Suzanne who asked how we differentiate between droppers and non-adopters. Uh, uh, but I will also give the floor to uh, Andrew, um, who was a bit uh, surprised by, by the finding, I guess, about uh, uh, droppers that may have larger micro acres or and others that may uh, have difficulties in accessing. So Andrew, uh, would you want to elaborate a bit on this question? and? Then we get uh, Liane answer and maybe a uh, feedback of Susan with uh, if you could also elaborate uh, Liane, Christina and Livia on how you differentiate it. So but first, Andrew. Maybe I was confused by what Liane said because I, I thought uh, just prior to me making that entry that Liane, you'd said that um, the, the droppers actually consulted more widely that, than the other groups. Uh, and then as soon, as soon as I put that comment into the chat, you then seem to say that the droppers had uh, narrower um, micro acuses than, than the other groups. So I was feeling a bit embarrassed, actually. But to, to some extent, the problem with your wealth of detail and, uh, and the um, detail that you've gone into is that the situation for one activity uh, it is somewhat different from another activity and it's what you've done is brilliant I agree with everyone else but it's all almost too detailed really you know you're you're picking out some details that that cannot readily be extrapolated uh be, beyond that particular circumstance but that's not a criticism I'm just kind of trying to defend uh, my, my silly entry in the chat no, it wasn't silly. That was my mistake, I'm sure, for the way I expressed it. So by and large, droppers have smaller microacus than adopters. But there are some cases and when actually they are larger if they're passing around for more information. But I wonder if maybe Livia or Christina could comment on that. Mm, the, the question of the, uh, the droppers or the, the person, the farmers that the, at some point decide to abandon innovation. It varies a lot according to the innovations, but normally it's related with this, um, the, the farmers that actually do a properly assessment. That's why they uh, have larger networks because they look actively for knowledge. So to do the proper assessment of the innovation and then they decide to not proceed with the, with the innovation at some point because they see that is not working in their cases. Um, and we also have the droppers that are more numerous because they are associated basically with two case studies, one case in Portugal and another case in Belgium. That in fact, the, the abandon of innovation was related with lack of support. They, did, uh, they didn't have uh, what we call, can call advisory support and they were left alone and they were not able to proceed with the innovation. So in that, in these cases, normally the fact that the innovation failure is much more, it's very much connected with the fact they were linked only with one advisor 
in one case, the, the private supplier of the technology in the Belgian case, and in the Portuguese case, with the local development association that, that were promoting the direct marketing. So the, this lack of diversification of their micro acres probably explain why they had also difficulties to proceed with innovation, but that actually shows a, a gap in the in the advisory at the local or regional level for these particular types of innovation that were both new things in the in the in the area. So novelties in the area. Normally that doesn't happen with the innovations that are already established and uh, where we have front runners and uh, have uh, farmers that are more advanced and others that are already, already following these, these advanced farmers. So probably it's linked with this uh, novelty of the innovation and uh, the gap in the local or regional advisory support system to, the, to these innovations. I don't know if, if that uh, helps or not. Yeah, you're muted. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, I think we will move on to other things. There are some very sophisticated comments that just came in, and uh, I'm not sure to be able to synthesize them. So thanks to Kevin and Gavin and Paul for very extensive comments. We, we will save the chat anyway and maybe get in touch with you uh, later on. There was one. Um, ongoing discussion which uh, Paul Daniels and uh, Annalisa were both of, uh, which was about the role of um, consultant versus traders. And maybe uh, Annalisa, if you could, um, uh, it was a while ago in the chat, I'm sorry, but you raise your point based on your experience and maybe you, should, uh, you, you could elaborate a bit on, uh, on your experience. Annalisa Dominici, do you, uh, do you hear me? And would you like to elaborate? Maybe she's not with us anymore. Uh, so maybe I will jump to, uh, to one uh, question by um, Sylvain. Uh, just coming if you could. If you need, I can elaborate uh, Annalisa's point uh, also, because it was a short discussion between her and me. Okay, so please go ahead. Annalisa uh, uh, told about or asked about uh, the fact how independent you can be as uh, advisor when you, uh, through some other channel, uh, sell products to farmers. And I believe, as far as I know, uh, the fast register uh, that the EU demands in that you do not sell any products. Um, in the Netherlands, we are uh, uh, responsible for upholding an independent advisory network um, from our association. And uh, one of the uh, linking pins is that uh, you cannot be... A, independent advisor when at the same time you work for a company that sells products. So that's uh, that, that, that was the whole point uh, uh, about independency. We will come uh, back to this in our policy recommendation. I think so. This, yes. I uh, saw it later we, also in the program. Yeah, what, what we had as a result is that uh, the type of advisors that you represent uh, may not be a majority in the actors that we spotted in our bottom-up analysis. And that's uh, yeah. the existence of such uh, independent advisors like you, or Annalisa, and many other who participate today uh, may not be the main, uh, the main uh, contact point to farmers in some context. Yeah. They do have more contact with link advisors. That's one of our reasons. Uh, so we, what we want to discuss is how to bring more transparency into the system and to, uh, to in terms of the content of advice. So that would be a, that's a teaser for discussion on <laughs> Friday morning when we continue to- Exactly, uh, Friday, it was my program. Yes. On this point. And, and advice as a profession is more or less formalized given on the country as well. So it's, it's an interesting point. 
a, a last one, maybe we could relate to a comment by uh, by Sylvain, which uh, could relate to uh, both the micro -ekis, but maybe the liam to uh, to the trigger notion. And so, uh, Sylvain, could you elaborate on uh, your point on complex advisory services and uh, and how do they fit in a lifelong uh, um, run of a farm, maybe? Uh, yes, actually, it was um, it was only a comment uh, um, because I think at some uh, moment um, Lian uh, mentioned that um, uh, advisory services uh, were different uh, according to the stages uh, of uh, the life circle of a farm, and uh, it, it is just um, an example from our own organization. So we 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 notice that um, mm, farmers mainly request. Uh, holistic uh, um, advice uh, about um, the business or orientations of, of their farm and um, the whole farm strategy at uh, certain stages of uh, the farm uh, life circle. Uh, so obviously uh, when uh, there is a new farming, uh, a new farmer uh, setting up uh, on, on a new farm, so um, it is linked to the transmission and uh, setting up of a new farmer. Or uh, sometimes when a farmer is uh, uh, planning very large uh, uh, investments, so uh, then uh, he, he or she can, uh, can ask for the support of a, a strategic uh, advisor. Or also when there are uh, major um, financial problems on the farm and uh, the whole um, farm strategy needs to be uh, refought. Uh, and uh, yes, this is what we observe. Uh, although we, we, we think it would be very useful for farmers to do that type of, um, of, um, of service uh, quite regularly to try to, to fine tune uh, the farm management. But um, in reality, uh, it is um, this type of service is requested only at uh, very uh, specific moments in, in the life of the farm. So, it was just a comment, uh, actually, to, to react on what you said, Ian. Thanks, Sylvain. That sounds like it broadly supports this idea of triggers. So particular things that happen that incentivize them to go looking for more advice on how to move forward. So thank you. If I could comment briefly on the issue of independent advice, I think we're going to talk about it more on Friday, but I think it's important to recognize that pretty much any advisor is dependent on something. They have some kind of a, a mandate. So one of the things we find with our even our FAS advisors here in Scotland, because half of their business is actually selling advice to farmers, they tend to spend their FAS time convincing farmers that actually they really need to pay for advice. <laughs> so they're not selling they're selling a product, but it's their own advice. And so getting them to facilitate interactive innovation processes and things that shift others into the position of expertise instead of themselves actually is really challenging because it's in complete opposition to the business model that makes their businesses successful. So yeah, we're going to get into that on Friday, but there's a lot of dynamics to what it means to be independent and independent of what that you need to really think about when we're putting these rules in place. And just to, to, co to react on or last comment, uh, that's actually our point that uh, independence is very tricky to delimitate, to find the boundaries given our results and that we plead for going to find a way to guarantee transparency and robustness of the content of advice through back office investment, uh, which are partly in line with what the commission proposed at the moment, I guess. So that will be a discussion. Uh, I'm sorry for Gavin, you have a very consistent uh, comment on uh, how to use whether it's possible to use a uh, trigger in the long run uh, and what would be the effects. Uh, so I guess I would ask Liam or someone maybe to, to comment on your, uh, or maybe Christina or someone to try to comment on your, on your, on your very uh, detailed uh, point of view, but we have to move on to the concluding session. I'm afraid it's really five to, uh, to four. Uh, so thanks to all of you for the discussion. Uh, you will have many other opportunity tomorrow morning uh, and um, as well during the policy recommendation, there will be a Q&A session as well after the round table. So uh, please join and we will continue the discussion. Um, so Liam, back to you for the final slots. Right, so we're back to the PowerPoint presentation, just a couple of more slides left for points that we wanted to get across. And in terms of how this can inform policy, these are points that I've, I've made already that I think 
we just need to reiterate that we think that this microacus method in particular can be really helpful in informing us about when and where to target advisory supports. So these, like Sylvain was pointing out that there are key moments in the life course of a farm and our triggering change model really brings that out. When farmers are actively seeking advice, they're actively seeking to make a change. And so making advice available to them at those points is likely to be quite powerful. There are things that we can do to specifically um, look at the microacus and consider what it's going to mean for droppers and to try and focus on droppers, for instance, to help them stay in, if that's what we think, to help these um, marginalized farmers, smaller, small to medium sized farmers um, get more access to advice. We can help work with other triggers. So uh, having money available for particular, um, for additional advice or additional supports when there is a disease outbreak or when there is a long period of low prices in a commodity, all those kinds of things contribute to developing advisory supports that are actually really helpful, really likely to make a big change instead of reinforcing the status quo or just incremental changes. And a lot of it has to do with timing. If we could go on to the last slide then. Just as an academic, obviously you can imagine we're quite interested in future research. And we did want to just underline that this is an enormous data set and it is going to be available if people are interested in working with us on further uh, analysis of it after the project, then please do get in touch because we don't, this isn't something that we're hoarding for ourselves. We really want to learn all that we can from it. Livia and Christina have put together a 200 page report on it already. And then there's a synthesis report as well that's nearly that size. So there's an enormous amount of data out there that we'd be happy to engage with you on. In terms of where we think more research is needed, something that became very clear to us through the project was that we need new methods. We need to get away from this idea of talking to the primary farmer, because in a lot of cases with the changing structure of agriculture in Europe, there is not one primary farmer. Or if you have the primary farmer, so the person who's running the farm business, that's not necessarily the person who's adopting these innovations or pursuing them. So we need to look at the idea of multiple farmers on the farm. So you see that with contract farming. We also need to look within the farming household. But quite often, these are innovations being taken forward by young people, so farm successors or other families family members, so the spouses of farmers, for instance, we need to be sure that everyone's being reached with advice or that the right people are being reached for advice to deal with these different things. We're also very conscious that there's a big gap between this kind of micro level ACUS that we've talked about and the macro ACUS or the ACUS is at national and European levels. So we think there needs to be more work done on how we can use this at regional and national levels to build this connection between the layers. I've also made a lot of you know, strong suggestions about how you can work with triggers and the changes in the cycle, but the fact is we've not tested this out. You know, We've done the empirical research to say we think there's potential to work with these triggers, but how you actually work with the triggers in a way that's gonna be effective, how you work at the different stages with different cohorts, that's something we think would really benefit from more research. And the last thing we found was kind of an interesting one. A lot of the thinking around agricultural knowledge systems, and this is in the literature, but also in the projects, has an implicit Western European bias. So it was really instructive for me in particular, working um, with Marta on our Czech case study to discover that actually when you're dealing in a situation where these are former collective farms that are enormous, that have you know, fleets of tractors and they, you know, they buy new tractors almost every year or they buy new combine harvesters on a regular basis, they have a potential for co-innovation in particular that is dramatically different from what you would find in a one-man band on a farm in the UK or, or France or, or Spain or Portugal. So I think there is actually a bias in our literature on Western European thinking about family farming. And I think there's a lot that we can do to bring in Eastern Europeans that we would find really instructive, both for understanding what happens in Eastern Europe and what's happening on some of these changing farms, the large scale farms in particular in Western Europe. So I'm going to leave it there as we head on to our last slide. We are right up to the last minute. There are a load of reports and digital stories and videos and things on the website. Do have a look. Do get in touch with any of us. I think a lot of us are fairly well known to the researchers in the group. So do feel free to do that or just go contact us through the website. And by all means, tweet um, about what you're hearing. This has been a really interesting discussion. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how it progresses over the next two days.